Hi, and today on Cracking the Cryptic, I'm actually going to show you myself tackling a Sudoku puzzle. It's um, from the Times on the 28th of November, what they call their super fiendish grade of puzzle, which is the hardest they publish. So um, there should be something instructive to watch as we see my solve. Now, just a bit of background. I'm not wonderfully familiar with the software. I don't use it much. So I think that adds a little bit to my time um, as I go around putting pencil marks in. And uh, the pencil marks, which is the kind of name for the little um, little numbers that you can put in, in cells to indicate possibilities. Um, it's quite important that you understand that when I do that, I'm not limiting the possibilities for one cell. What I'm doing is within one three by three box, limiting where a certain number can go. So I'll put both or all three of the possible places where one number can go in a box when I consider that that's worth it. So it's, it's certainly, you know, the background is that Sudoku is a logic problem and an, el an elimination logic problem. So you're just trying to limit the possibilities down until you reach the only one that is possible to solve the puzzle. So here's the start. And you can see I'm kind of scanning around the grid for anything useful. And there I've spotted that the only place in that top middle box for a six that it could possibly go, given the other sixes in the grid, is where I've put it. So then I'm looking to start filling in a few pencil marks of where the limited possibilities are. Ah, there's another six on the left that, again, in its box is the only place it could go. Um, fives in the top set of boxes could only be in the two cells that I've numbered with small fives. Sevens, you can see, are limited in the middle left box because of this seven and this seven, and that in turn limits them down here. And that becomes quite useful when one discovers that the six down here also has to be in those two boxes. And therefore, six and seven are fixed in those two boxes between themselves, which only leaves a certain number of other boxes for things like fives. Once you know those fives go there, this five is fixed in the center. And that allows a little bit more progress as well. In fact, this five, um, is very useful into this box here. Oh, I obviously moved on. Oh yes, three was fixed in that box. But, um, and that's fixed the three up here. Given that I've got a four down here now, we can know that one seven are there in this right-hand side box. And given that one seven eight and four three six are already in the box now, in some form, two nine five must go down there. That fixes this five. And again, you know, the progress just carries on. Twos must be there. Nines must be down there in this box. Um, I think at this point I decide to fill in the possibilities for five, two, and nine in these three. Although they can't be resolved at this point, um, it could become useful soon to know which two could be two, which two could be five, and which two could be nine. Um, then we've managed to limit four and seven up here because there's a four and seven in this column, four and seven in this row. Um, and again, that helps limit the number of box possibilities there as well. Um, ones down here, ones up here. Now I'm still looking for kind of a bit more of a breakthrough because this has been helpful, but I still need something more. Um, threes have to be in this row and therefore in this row because of that three being fixed and those numbers all being filled in there. And then we're limiting nines. I think here I'm still just kind of searching for a bit of a breakthrough. And the one that I do find in the end is based on the fact that in this column here where I'm pointing with my moving cursor, we have one, six, seven, two. And in this box up here, we already have four, five. And given 1, 6, 7, 2, and 4, 5 are gone, 3, 9, 8 must be this set of 3 in this top box. And once I notice that, I clearly know which one has to be the 3, which is here where I'm pointing. So 9 and 8 have to go up there. And that starts really limiting the possibilities up in that box. Once that's 3, 9, 8, 
you've got 654, that must be the 1 because 7 and 2 are already gone. I think that's where I've just noticed it. And this was one of the oh, uh, misprinted, I, I, don't, I don't know that's a 9 already, so that's a 9 or 8, and that's an 8 or 9. Um, that has to be a 1, I think I figured that out, yeah. So 2 and 7 are up there. We can, this, this cell in the top right is the last in its rows, so that'll be easy when I notice that. Um, that's going to fix where the 1 goes up here, that's going to resolve the 1 down here. And um, from here on, the logic kind of progresses fairly helpful. So for me in this puzzle, that was a very necessary breakthrough. I think there's one point coming up where it's not simple deduction remaining. And although I could have got through it in a different way, um, what I used was a principle called uniqueness, where... It's fair to assume, because the paper has published the puzzle, that there's only one solution. If there's only one solution, that limits what, the puzzle, what, the, what could possibly be going on. Um, and by that I mean that you couldn't, for instance, have 9 and 8 in these two boxes where I'm pointing here, and also in these two boxes, because then you could never resolve what they were going to be. So I know at some point that these are 9 and 8. I think this is me figuring that out now. So those two boxes are definitely 9 and 8. Now, 9 in this bottom middle box can't be in those three cells or in that cell. So it must be in those two as well. And because of this principle of uniqueness, I've just filled in the 8 there. I know that 8 can't also be in those two boxes or this 4 would be an 8989 eight, combination that could never be resolved. So I can deduce from that that 8 will go in this box I'm pointing to now, because it can't go in the three central ones there. And by this principle of uniqueness, it can't be in those two. So 8 must go in there. Now, there are some purists who don't think uniqueness is a uh, fair tool to use, but I'm not quite sure what constitutes fairness. For myself, I'm trying to solve the puzzle quickly. As long as I'm not testing it for somebody else, I know that they've printed a puzzle that will solve, and therefore I can apply this principle of uniqueness. I clearly haven't spotted it yet, but I think I'm about to now, and that is what fixes the 8 in this box here. Um, have I worked that out? You can kind of see my thought process is happening. There it goes. And that is the final... Um, deduction that I needed to finish off this puzzle. Everything else that I haven't really commented on is a fairly straightforward deduction following from what's already in the grid and just requiring the solver to spot it to know exactly what the possibilities must be. So now this is me finishing off and I think my time in the end is about seven and something minutes. So um, it's not bad for a super fiendish I am, as I said, somewhat handicapped by not just using the software and the fact that I'm not that quick with it. Um, seven minutes and five seconds, so that's a pretty good time. Um, but I am also slightly handicapped by the fact that if I was doing this in real time, solving on paper, I'd be able to make some other pencil marks I'd be able to first of all make quicker pencil marks, like this 8 and 9 up here. I wouldn't have written both in both cells. I'd have written them on the kind of joining of the cell, which saves a little time. But what saves a bit more time is that I can make other kind of indications in the grid where I know something else is going on. So that does save some time. But that's the super fiendish solved with the software in 7 minutes and 5 seconds. And quite a few useful techniques within the one puzzle there. So I hope that's potentially helped you with your solving and uh, thanks for watching.